Hey guys, this is Nick and welcome to my Linux experiment. These are your Linux and open source news for the first half of April 2020. This month we have a bunch of stuff to cover, including discussions on the future of GNOME and a GNOME theming API, a deep in remix of Ubuntu and some fears around the libraries that enable the KDE team to create their desktop. So let's start right after this. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode provides virtual servers that make it easy and affordable to host anything in the cloud. I've shown you how to set up your own Minecraft server on Linode, but with their one-click apps, you can also deploy servers for other games like Arc, Rust or CSGO. If you're looking to build your own website, Linode offers a lot more power and control over your server than entry-level hosting solutions, and lets you truly own your website. Every plan comes with Linode's fully human-powered customer support, so if you need help, you will have someone on the phone answer your emails or even reply to you on social networks 24-7, 365 days a year. If you're more into doing it all yourself, Linode has thousands of docs to help you do all the things you want and even things you didn't know you wanted to do, because if it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. Get $20 free credit on your new Linode account by signing up at linode.com slash linuxexperiment, I'll leave a link in the description below. April the 1st. The Linux Foundation training program is back on, with 500 scholarships offered this year. You have until April the 30th to apply and try and learn some new skills and get certified. The training is adapted to newcomers and veterans as well, so if you want to improve your knowledge of Linux or make a career out of it, don't hesitate to apply. April the 2nd. Adrien Plaza from the GNOME team has published an interesting article on how GDK and GNOME could support some kind of theming through a coloring API. What he proposes and explains is the following. Applications could access a few of the colors variables that are defined in GNOME's theme, which work with CSS, to be able to customize the title of a color or other elements of the interface. Users could also tweak the colors to choose an accent color themselves, and finally, distributions could override some of the colors of the theme through G settings. This would enable distribution makers, app developers, and users to tweak and change the colors with the stable API and avoid breaking the visual identity of apps. It will be interesting to follow. You can now buy the Pine Phone pre-installed with Ubuntu Touch, or UB ports, however you want to call it. This version of the phone ships with UB ports pre-installed, a custom etched case with the UB ports logo, and improvements from the Braveheart device that I tried out on the channel before. It should ship in late May 2020, and each sale will help finance the UB ports project, as well as the Pine64, so it might be time to grab one of these if you want to support Linux-powered phones. April the 3rd. Linux users of ProtonMail rejoice, because ProtonMail Bridge, the little program that allows you to sync your ProtonMail account with a desktop client, is now available on our platform. It should work with any desktop client that supports IMAP or SMTP. This means that you can use whatever program you want instead of the webmail, and use your encrypted email offline as well. ProtonMail Bridge seems to have specific optimizations for Mozilla Thunderbird as well. You can download the Bridge app through the official website in DEB or RPM format. Clear Linux now has access to Chrome, FFmpeg, Skype, Microsoft Teams, Zoom and VS Code. The distro put together by Intel has been criticized for lacking some key software in their repos, but they now support third-party repos in the package management system. This system has been put to good use by some people who crafted an unofficial repository hosting all of these various applications and libraries, which should make Clear Linux a better choice for users in the long run. April the 4th. Proton, the Windows compatibility layer aimed at gaming on Linux, will now start releasing betas and release candidates prior to the final release to help make sure that these can be tested more and prevent regressions and issues. The first one to be available this way is Proton 5.0-6RC1, which you can get by going to Steam, displaying the tools and editing the properties of the Proton 5.0 tool to enable the next beta channel. It should help make sure that new releases of Proton don't break stuff that used to work and prevent some new issues popping up. Incidentally, this new RC made Resident Evil 3 work for me on Linux, so expect a few videos on that in the gaming channel. April the 6th. Ubuntu Deepin DE, or Ubuntu DDE, has released its first beta, based on Ubuntu 20.04. This new unofficial spin on Ubuntu uses the Deepin desktop, a desktop environment that is beautiful, fast and novel in terms of how it works and how you can customize it. Deepin is usually reserved to the Deepin distribution, made in China, which raises some concerns from some users, and their servers and repositories are kinda slow and not that up to date. Ubuntu DDE could do away with these issues and open up the desktop environment to more users. April the 7th. 
Firefox 75 was released with a revamped address bar showing your top sites, making search suggestions more readable, and adjusting the selection mechanism on Linux. A single click selects all the bar's content, double clicking selects a word, and triple clicking selects everything. Firefox 75 is also available as a flatpak now, which is nice for people who want to only use this distribution method. Some mockups have popped up for a GNOME tablet interface. Now, some might say that GNOME already looks like it's designed for touchscreens, but these mockups would create an interface that looks amazing on smaller tactile form factors. It's well thought out, with multi window layouts, a notification clock side panel, and some elements reminiscent of Fosh, the phone shell developed by Purism for the Librem 5. These are not final and might not get implemented at all, but I think it's interesting with a renewed interest in Linux mobile devices like the PinePhone or PineTab. Microsoft has announced a new Linux security module called IPE. This module is optional and would allow the Linux kernel to see if some binaries have been tampered with and are trying to execute altered or malicious code and block them from executing. It's obviously not intended for general usage, but more for Linux system administrators or for embedded systems. It's interesting to see Microsoft working on dedicated Linux modules, but since they have their own distro for their cloud servers, called Azure Sphere, it's not that surprising. April the 8th. GNOME announced the GNOME Community Engagement Challenge. It's a competition that aims to attract developers to engage with open source software and create new solutions that would in turn bring more coders to our platform. Entrants have to come up with creative ways to promote open source software to future developers, namely kids in college and high school. There is no limit on the type of propositions people can submit, and there is a global pool of $65,000. Entries will be sorted in three phases, with the first selection of 20 propositions, then filtered to four, and finally the choice of the winner. Each phase winners will receive progressively bigger amounts of money. The winner should be announced in spring 2021, so start thinking about what we could do to bring more developers to the open source world. April the 10th. Wine 5.6 has been released with a very interesting load of fixes, notably on the Media Foundation. This is an issue that's been plaguing Wine and Proton to run the latest games, requiring to launch scripts manually to ensure cutscenes would play. Some games affected are Borderlands 3, Resident Evil 2 and 3, and a lot more. These advancements won't solve the issue entirely, but should help more games play audio and video when running with Wine or Proton. Conversion to various modules into the PE format should also pave the way to better support various anti-cheat software, so it's a very good release on Elan. The usual bug fixes for various games are there as well, with 38 issues fixed, including for Warframe, Star Wars The Old Republic, Dead Space, Diablo 3, and a lot more. There is a bit of a scare in the KDE QT community, as the Qt company CEO said that as a result of economic impacts of the current crisis, they might be forced to restrict all QT releases to paid license holders for 12 months. While the Qt company later issued a very brief statement stating that they are committed to open source and their government's models, it didn't alleviate all fears that this foundation used by the whole KDE project might have to be forked. This would obviously be a bad thing since it would ask a lot of the existing KDE team. The Limer Pro, System76's lightest Linux laptop yet, has been released. It weighs less than a kilogram and can handle 14 hours of battery life. It also sports open firmware licensed under the GPL v3 and can handle being plugged into an external display and recharged at the same time through a single USB-C port. It's available for a base price of $1099 and can be spec'd up to 4TB of NVMe storage, a Core i7 CPU and 40GB of RAM. April the 13th. Asus released a graphics card based on a 2016 design, the GT710. While it won't be a great gaming card for recent titles, it is the last design that didn't require any proprietary firmware, so it can run using the Nouveau driver by default without any additional drivers installed. If you need a relatively cheap GPU at around $50 and you want to keep using open source drivers, it can be a good choice. The small form factor also means you could plug that into any small computer for light gaming or living room PC since the card is passively cooled and should stay pretty silent. April the 15th. Proton 5.0-6 was released after a brief period of being available as a beta. It's got a lot of fixes and improvements for Doom Eternal, Resident Evil 2 Remake, Dead Space, Elder Scrolls Online and the Rockstar Launcher. They didn't manage to update DXVK this time around, apparently due to some regressions. Continuing their efforts to lay out their plans clearly, the GNOME team has published a new blog post explaining the various areas they'd like to focus on in the future. They outline the app launcher, where they feel the app grid is not particularly useful to help users find applications that would be the most useful or more likely to be used. 
the activities overview where they'd like to present stuff more in accordance to how the various elements relate to each other, and the boot experience where everything is empty by default and not that helpful to guide the user. They also plan on implementing more touchpad gestures in the shell to reach the search and app grid. It's a fairly interesting outline. If you'd like to see where GNOME is going next, I encourage you to give it a read. And that's it for these news. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, don't hesitate to like, subscribe and turn on notifications. If you really liked the video, I have a Patreon page. Patrons get to pick which topics I'll work on each month, as well as a monthly Patreon cast where I answer questions and talk a bit more about myself and the channel. I'll leave a link in the description below. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!